So, our next speaker wants to make passwords redundant and will tell us a little bit about uh, FIDO2. So, please welcome Sai with FIDO2, the superior multi-factor authentication framework. Did someone, did someone boo? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about FIDO, but I will like use the uh, the word WebAuthn or the name WebAuthn um, probably even more. I will explain why in a second. Uh, my name is Christian Orsai. I'm a software developer from Germany. I am a little interested in security and DevOps stuff and automation. I have worked system administration before all that new modern DevOps stuff came up. I do organize a meetup about this stuff also in southern Germany in Karlsruhe. And I am in, like a little uh, into Milliways Orga. So if I have screamed at you for standing in the way in the kitchen, I'm very sorry. All right. So I have um, put together a small agenda for today. I will talk about what FIDO2 or in specific WebAuthn is like explain how it works and um, why you want to use it and why you probably should use it over the alternatives, but I'm open for discussion afterwards. Um, how does it work? And then I will talk specifically about passkeys because this is coming like a new hype, I think, for security. And it might be really cool for a lot of people, but it might be slightly almost cool for some people sitting in here. Um, we'll see how that goes. So what is FIDO? And I think I wrote something next to it, actually. Oh, yeah, I, I copied the slide. Good job. Um, so there is two parts to FIDO. And the most interesting part is WebAuthn, which is a W3C standard. And then there's the FIDO2, which is actually a brand. But most people use those names like and swap it out. Um, FIDO2 is a brand by the FIDO Alliance and a lot of the big internet companies like Amazon, Google, also 1Password and a lot of security companies um, are part of that alliance. And they set the standard and work on stuff like WebAuthn. Um, they're also pushing, those, most of those are also the ones pushing for pass keys which is, yeah, it's okay, I guess. And I think the, the internet overall is going to profit a lot from this in a from a security perspective. Um, and yeah, I'll go to this a little later. I will show you just for a second how this works, WebAuthn. So I have, when I prepared this, I have found a, ta uh, a, a website. This one is, I think it's from Duo Security, if some of you know this. Um, it's webauthn.io, but there's multiple listed on the FIDO Alliance and the webauthn um, pages. You can Google uh, those. This one here I found very good to get a general understanding how this works because it just you can just play around with it. Uh, let's say I will register a new account here. Um, and let's say this is called Sci, uh, CCC Camp. And then there's a couple of settings you need to it. Um, I'll just... I forgot to turn this, no, wrong one. I just forgot to turn this one off for now, but we'll get to it later. Um, so you press register, you can create a passkey, and this is like a spoiler, <laughs> because passkey is basically a wrapper around WebAuthn. Um, and, I can, and you can choose like a security key, this device, so this is a MacBook, standard MacBook, nothing fancy. Security key would be like something like a YubiKey. I'm using a Nitro key here. Um, YubiKey is like, I think, the most well-known producer and a big part of the FIDO lines also. Um, probably all of you have seen YubiKeys at work. Nitro key is a company from Germany, uh, which does a lot of open source work. I just want to give them a little shout out. They sponsored a Nitro key for me. Um, but like, it's up to you. It's the same thing. It's a USB key that you can put to your keychain and uh, carry it around next to you, and hopefully not next to your laptop in your bag. All right, let's lose, lose and use a security key. And now I have to touch it. And something went wrong. Oh, that's, that's cute. 
<laughs> whoops, yeah, probably timeout. So you have a couple of seconds to use the, the UB key or FIDO Nitro key, whatever key. And so now the server has like, um, I'll explain a little later, but what we have essentially done is we have created a public key or private public key pair, and we have sent the public key of this to the server. Um, and now when I go to webauthn.io, and I will do this in a private tab, just to make sure the sessions don't interfere, it should work out of the box. And we said size CCC camp. And now I can authenticate. Oh, that's good. Oh, one was why? <laughs> yeah, good, good catch. Thank you. All right, so authenticate. Now this thing, the site knows that I have set a passkey for this username, so it quotes, it queries me to to use my passkey. Um, so I, I, I use the security key, there's multiple uh, additional versions. I touch the key and now it says I'm logged in. And then it shows the credentials that I have here. There's like, this is just an ID. Uh, if you want, you can take note of this and you cannot hack my web auth and IO account later with it. Um, doesn't matter anyway because they will delete the account tomorrow. All right. You get a lot of like webauthn.io, webauthn.guide, I think is the, the big one from the FIDO Alliance. They have a lot of um, resources if you want to, to learn more and in depth stuff about this. All right. So basically, this was like already an example where you don't use a password. So this is basically you give them your username, they know who you are, they can map your pub key that you have saved there while uh, registering, uh, registering. Um, and then you can authenticate with it later multiple times, obviously, every time you want to log in. All right. Uh, yes. OK. So what is it actually? And this is from the definition of WebAuthN, the WebAuthN framework. It says, this is a better alternative for securing your sensitive information online. And the WebAuthN works for, uh, like for an alternative uh, authentication factor in addition to your password, but it also works without. And it will still be multi-factor authentication if you don't use a password. And I will show you in a second how that works or why this works. So there's a kind of factors that you can use for multi-factor authentication. Some of these might be the alternative to WebAuthn. So this, like on the left side, I put is on the left, yeah. On the left side, I put a lot of a lot of keys. There's multiple brands in addition to YubiKey and Nitro Key. There's also Titan Key. I think Google uses this, or it used to do, and they have some blogs on how to implement this. Um, and I, I did some screenshots from Chrome just because it's like the most. It's, I'm uh, no advertising, okay? Um, so you can use a password to log in as a kind of a factor, but this is here. Um, Basically, the, the two Google Chrome screenshots are doing the same. Um, they use your local device, in this regard, my laptop, to log you in. So you don't necessarily have to have a YubiKey. You can also uh, save the key pair that you're using for logging in with WebAuthn to your device. It might be your cell phone, might be your laptop, and therefore you have the, the, the um, you just need any kind of authenticator that is um, certified, and the keys are one way, and your laptop and your modern day um, cell phone are the other way. And they use the TPM chip on the cell phone or like the security chip hardware um, on the cell phone or your computer to generate the keys. The YubiKey has the hardware on uh, like in, inside built in. Um, you can also use as, as a measure of, uh, of another factor to log in, something like biometrics. Um, I, I don't know if there is iris scan available for, for modern day laptops or, or computers, but I, get we'll, I guess we'll go there at some point. Um, you can use Windows Hello and then basically do either password or face or thumb or whatever you have. Um, in the end, it all boils down to everything you use without the YubiKey is the device and you have to unlock it. So it doesn't matter if you have the password or the biometrics. You know, like you can use Touch ID on your phone, but you can always always just not use Touch ID and put in the 
um, just the password to unlock it. And um, once you log in, um, your device will query you for whatever credential you want to use. And this is already one of the backsides of, or the downsides of using a non extra security token and just your device because you might also save your credentials like your username and password on the same device that you now are saving or using to authenticate. So if someone knows your device password, they can just, and, and has your device obviously, so this is like the two things that you need and therefore it's multi-factor authentication. Um, you need the device and the password and then you can like unlock the authentication, no matter if it's password or passkey or uh, passkey or, or web auth and as second to password and whatnot. Um, and this is already one of the downsides because if you lose your phone and you have like um, saved all your credentials into your phone and use it as a second factor, it's all in the same device. Um, it might not be a problem for people sitting here. But just take a look at your coworkers when they unlock their phones. Like, don't shoulder surf, but just how they do it. A lot of people will use gesture wiping, swiping on their phones, which is very insecure, has been shown to be very insecure. Um, a lot of people will use like pin codes, like one, two, three, four, five, or up to six, whatever your enterprise has set, even in the worst case scenario. Um, this is everything you need. Once you have set a passkey or web authentic credential on there, someone just needs the phone, and if it's badly secured, you're still screwed. And yes, it's the same when you put the YubiKey next to the laptop or the phone, obviously, like at some point, just imagine you are some IT department, most of you are admins, or some of you are admins, you have users, you know every step you do to make them more secure, they will find a way to, you know, fuck you over. All right. Okay, WebAuthn. Um, WebAuthn is a specification that defines an API enabling the creation and use of strong, attested, scope, public key-based credentials of, you, you don't have to, to like, I'll get <laughs> into some single point of this. So this is just from the spec. Um, so basically, um, there's a strong public key based credential that you are generating. Yeah, it has, like, for example, the current YubiKey does, uh, I think it should mean ECDSA and ED25519, stuff like elliptic curves, modern cryptography. Um, if you have an old YubiKey, you should not use it. Then again, if you use it, you're still better off than not using any second factor at all, obviously. Um, the FIDO2 spec has like a minimum security level that you have to use. And you can, if you are administering the server that does the authentication, you can set the min level. So there is kind of a, if, you're, if your server does not like support EDDSA, or I think it should be ECDSA, I don't know. Um, but like, if you don't support it and the user has no other has no other means, they can just not register a web auth and key. Um, it the the credentials should be attested for. This means in a web auth and speech or an, an, an W3C speech that the key requires possession of an authenticator. So basically you need to have a device which is either a security token or a phone or a modern laptop. Um, and it also verifies it. So basically, one is to register, one is to authenticate. So the server sees you have the, the pub key, so it assumes you own and have the laptop in hand. Um, it has to be somewhat hardware-based. Um, then it's scoped, and this is really interesting. A key pair is generated per website. So this means if you log in and, and create a, or register a web auth and key set for Google, your laptop will not, or your device will not reuse it for, let's say, Amazon, okay? Um, this is pretty cool because while your private key will never leave your device, and this is the 2019 before we were talking pass keys, um, your private key will never leave the device, you only handing out pass keys. And this is actually cool from a privacy side, but also because when someone finds your pass key in a, a your pub key, sorry, in a leaked uh, server database, um, they have no idea if you used it to go and 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 re reuse it somewhere else because you can't by the spec. Um, and but this also means that um, as a server administrator, 
if you are offering auth web auth n or fido2 as a server administrator you just get people's pop keys so you don't have to care like top secret for them like you would have to with passwords and hash them because you need like the the plain key because it's only generated for your device people can like attackers cannot use this pop key to log into anything else if your customers have their pop key stolen from you all right installation we already done because all modern browsers and systems Aster uh, like uh, it has a footnote most modern browsers and uh, systems already implemented the web auth n standard is supported by almost every browser that there is firefox actually does it but not to the full fido2 extent specification okay there is still some trouble with i, I don't use firefox so i i was had a hard time finding combinations that would work and not i think the problem is that you cannot use Currently, I think it's uh, what you cannot use is security tokens with pass keys in combination with Firefox on mobile or something like that. So they are working on it. Um, I think uh, I saw the, I think it's somewhere in the next two or three uh, versions, Firefox will also add the full feature set. Mm -hmm. um, but all the others should do it. It comes with a flavor. Chrome based browsers just do it. I, uh, I, what is, what's it called? Safari, like uh, WebKit, uh, macOS browsers, or Apple browsers, they have like a, they used in, in 2019 when WebAuthn was released, people were really happy for Apple because they were one of the first to actually support this. And now, if you want, now they, they are going full passkey mode. Now you have to enable iCloud password sync if you want to use the WebAuthn feature. There's a hand. Oh, it's the, I'm sorry, <laughs> never mind. I should not have reacted to hands and stuff, mm -hmm. my bad. All right, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, okay, it's, it's supported by most browsers or people are doing it. Safari, for Safari you need to enable Cloud Sync and that's for pass keys. But the main fee or one of the main features of, of WebAuthn was that they advertised it that the credentials never use, uh, never, uh, never go out of your machine. So now they like completely turned around and said, pass keys, basically the credentials do move out of your machine. So now you have to think about which one is better, actually. All right, so talking multi-factor authentication, um, there's a couple of alternatives. Um, most of you will know the Google Authenticator, all the Microsoft Authenticator things, where you have a time-based code, usually six digits long, that you can generate for a website, and it will recycle every, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, and uh, you have to do the input this after your password. Obviously, if you send a string to a server, someone can intercept it, or uh, can, like, fish you, because in the same way with a password, they just have to like use it quicker than your password. Your password doesn't expire, the TOTP tokens expire after 30 seconds, it's still fishable. Um, what's also a, a currently being rolled out by, by most companies is that you have an app on your phone, and when you log in on some device, you get a notification on the app, you have to click, yes, this was me, I just tried to log into google.com or so. So if you get fished, so you go to a fake website and accidentally, because you think it's the real Google, you enter your credentials there, your username and your password. How does it help that you have a cell phone when they just like proxy it to Google? You just logged in. So obviously you're waiting for a notification to happen on your phone. Obviously you will click, yes, this was me. Even though the actual uh, authentication comes from Google, and not from the phishing side. So yeah, great stuff. Uh, looks like this. I managed to uh, input German screenshots. I'm very sorry. Like just imagine, you get you you are prompted to enter a six-digit code into a fake website, um, and the server bot, because it has to be very quickly, just uses it instantly to send it to Google or to Microsoft. But with a time slice of like 30 seconds left, you can actually copy it by hand so and you can then after logging in, even reuse the TOTP code to add a new authenticator um, that's not like main of the talk here we can talk about this later uh, TOTP is not phishing proof 
So how does web authn work communication wise? How how where I'm talking a lot about keys and pub keys and servers and whatnot, but how does it actually work? So FIDO2 combines two frameworks or two protocols, protocol like things, I don't know the, the real correct word for this. Um, so web authn is the communication that happens between your browser and the backend server that you're authenticating to. It's also called a relying party. Um, in, in WebAuthn, and this, as I said, is implemented by most browsers by now. Um, and then you have the CTAP client to authenticator protocol. This is basically how your browser is allowed to talk through your hardware with your security key or with your operating system that acts as the authenticator. And this is like in modern, all modern systems can do this already. So let's imagine you want to register new keys, and it doesn't matter if it's passwordless or as a second factor after the password. So basically, you as a client with your key authenticator thing, you go to the server and, and you're like, hey, I want to register a new pass key. My name is Chris. If you have already have a user account, you're already logged in. The server knows this. Server wants a pass key. Um, you generate keys locally, you save the private key locally, obviously, because in private public key you need the private key um, for, for, your, for signing messages. Um, and you give the pub key to the server, who saves it with your name on it. So next time you, you tell the server that you are Chris, you can then sign a message that the server sends you when you authenticate, and the server can then verify because they have your pub key that you have signed this message with your private key. So this is like PGP basics, right? Um, or GPG. So I want to talk about a couple of options. So this what up to now this is just like the most basic workflow they have. Maybe you have seen this picture around the internet for quite some time. And that's what I was talking about. Somebody, some administrators in the past added uh, token-based authentication or multi-factor authentication um, to their servers. So their admins would have to use another device to generate a password or a short-term password that they used to log in. And then there's people who just hang this up with camera in front on the internet. Um, so they don't have to be in touch with the device, which is like, it totally defeats the purpose, right? Um, and if you're using security tokens or um, stuff like the device as an authenticator, there's multiple uh, options that you can set as a relying party or authenticating server to force people or to force your client to use a certain settings. You know, like especially for security keys, you usually have a, a button or like even a fingerprint reader that is locally saved to the key or kind of some something you have to press and um, it's not like connected to your computer. You have to physically press it. So this is like the, the most um, basic one. You can uh, set verification to discourage. So it's just if I want to use the YubiKey to sign in, I must press the button. But as a server administrator, you can also side. Uh, uh, you can also decide that the security token has to be secured with a pin code that the, the user has to enter. So it's even more factors, basically. Like, I think the most, like if you, if you play it like all the way around, you can go username, password, you have to have the YubiKey, you have to press it so you're physically there. Then you have a prompt on your computer that prompts you to enter the pin for the YubiKey. The server doesn't know that. This is a local setting, okay? Um, and if you set this to required, which you shouldn't in my opinion, um, there is, two possibilities. Either, either the user can enter the key, and if they can't, like if they don't know it, but also <laughs> obviously if they can't uh, from a technical standpoint because their system doesn't allow for it, they would just, you can't, you can't log in. Okay? And then there's something in between is preferred where you as a user, it should, it should read user can decide. So when I set up my YubiKey, I can, I can with the managing software from the vendor, I can decide to have a pin code on my YubiKey or not. Okay, and the server will respect this if it's set to preferred. Okay, um, then there's a very controversial, I, 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 I won't go through all the settings, okay? This is like the second of two <laughs> configuration items that I find particularly interesting. Um, 
and this one is rather controversial. Um, there is the option to set a discoverable, that's just like the name in, in the spec, or a non-discoverable credential. Um, and then there's again three, par three ways, um, like the server can decide, just don't do it, dear client. And then they can say, prefer, then the client can decide. But this is like not something you as a user choose, but this is like the OS setup chooses, and it will use the discoverable one. And I'll talk about what it is in a second. Or you can require it as a server uh, site type. And uh, yeah, the, pref uh, the, the default is preferred right now. I think it's a bad idea. I'll come to it in a second. So discoverable credential means there is actually a fresh key um, created for this website, as I said before, as was, was part of the WebAuthn standard. Um, like this is all the same. It can include a username. So this means I go to Google, they don't support it, but let's just imagine I go to a server where I want to authenticate. I just like put my YubiKey or my Nitro key or my whatever key um, in, in my laptop and press the button and I have never entered a username. It's basically like it's okay for certain scenarios. Like imagine somebody like I, I'm, I work in retail, let's just say a cashier wants to log into the uh, cash box. It's okay that they just put the YubiKey or the uh, Nitro key or whatever key inside the machine, press the button, and they know this is user 1234, and they have the password. They don't need the password. It's, it's completely cool. Um, and this makes a username less login possible. It has downsides because I have like, I don't know, five Google accounts. How would Google know which one I want? You know? But since the, the username is included in the key, I can just send them the, the I can sign the message. They can just cross-reference it with their pub key setup. Um, and at some point they will find a an account that matches this, that can uh, like verify this this signed message. So it must be me. The problem is that you can't decide on a YubiKey or a Nitro key which uh, key to use. Like you can't have, it's impossible to have three keys for different Google accounts if you don't add usernames. All right. Um, and the other problem is that you security keys especially, which are really cool and I would really love to use one on everything, they can only hold X keys. Like the top Nitro key currently can, can save up to 25 discoverable keys. And this is like the preferred setup. I don't know if you have a password manager. My password manager has like over 500 passwords. If I were to, re to, to do pass keys on all of those and replace all of those, I would need 20 UB keys if they all used like discoverable credentials. Okay? Even though, if, even if they don't use username lo uh, less login, that would cost me like a shitload of money and, and my, my, uh, my key would not look like this, but more like this, okay? Uh, Nitro Key has 50 keys, there's other brands that do more. Your laptop can hold basically an infinite number, okay? Um, so you don't have the problem with, with laptop then, or phone. And then there's the non-discoverable credential, and in my opinion, if you don't need the username less login, please use this. So if you're an administrator, set the discoverable credential setting to discouraged. Um, what's going to happen is the security tokens, like the USB keys, but also your TPM chip and stuff, they have a master password or master key. And this is basic public key cryptography. We have a master key, and then you get a seed, like a nonce or a string from the server when you are creating and, and registering a key set. And from this master key, you create another key set. Because the cool thing is, like, okay, uh, you can later recreate it. You don't have to save this key set. Um, so basically, this is how it happens. I, I go to the server. I'm like, hey, I'm Chris, or I am actually like Chris's operating system. Um, so and the server is like, um, okay, cool. Use please use this nonce. And I have actually like when I was looking over the slides earlier, I'm not sure currently if this is 16 or 64 bits. But yeah, bear with me. It's a string. Um, so then I generate from my master key a new key set. And then I send the pub key of this new key set to the server. And I use the, uh, the combination of the master key and the nonce for this. And um, 
the server will send the pass uh, the pub key, but will also uh, will save it, but will also save the nonce. Um, so when I authenticate, actually, uh, or use it as a second factor, I come back to the server. I must say I am Chris because the server has no way to decide this otherwise. Um, so the server has to send me my nonce and a message to sign, I forgot this, sorry. Um, and then I can generate the keys from the nonce on the fly while authenticating, and then I can use the regenerated private key to sign the message and send it to the server. And from there on, the server can't really decide if I have saved the pub key before, uh, the, the private key before, um, or if I have recreated it, and the server doesn't care. Because they say, like, from a server standpoint, if I have the master key and it is branded into the hardware it doesn't it doesn't matter if if you have created a new key or not okay um yeah and then the server can verify that it's indeed you all right so quick wrap up um phishing is to my knowledge impossible because um your client will save the um the actual or will use the the actual like URL endpoint to create the keys. So if you have a key that you're, you registered with Google.com and someone tries to fish you with fake Google.com, you won't have a key for fake Google.com. Even if they manage to persuade you on a phishing site to create a key for fake Google.com, .com, you can never use it to log into actual Google.com. There's no way. The only way would be if there's a problem with HTTPS or TLS, because this relies on service certification and stuff. Okay, but even if you proxy the traffic, there's no way that you can. You can. You might have. If you proxy the traffic, now that won't work because you have a different address. If you man in the middle the traffic, obviously this doesn't help because you could still get the authentication or the what's it called session token or stuff like that. But for there's no way that, that someone that can uh, convince me on a fake site to insert my credentials that I all that they can use like the uh, my keys. The convenience is pretty high, I think, especially if you use like only your computer for not so secure accounts. Like imagine um, with the alternatives, like you log in on your desktop, you put in your username, you put in your password. And then you get prompted for a key, you fumble in your bag for your phone, you put up, you have to start your authenticator app, you watch through, you scroll through your, I don't know, 200 TOTP token settings to get the key. You have to type it in, oh shit, the time slice is up, you have to get another one. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's much easier, especially if you, stuff, if you use stuff like Face ID or Touch ID to just like tap the touch scanner once. Or if you have Face ID to just have your, the camera scan your face once. Um, and uh, this is really bad of me because it should say the server only knows the public key, right? I'm really, whoops, that would be fun. All right, okay. Um, all right, let's say the server only knows the, the public key, okay? Um, so there's no way, if they have the public key, they have no way of telling who, if it's you, an attacker that can extract the public key, they can't do a shit without, uh, with it. No way. Contra. If you use secure tokens, you might have to spend a couple euros on them. So I think the cheapest ones are like 10, 15 euros um, that, that fit the standard. Um, if you like, let's say if you want different devices, like use desktop for logging in and phone for the authentication device, you can use this uh, through scanning QR codes on the phone from your, uh, on the desktop from your phone and stuff. You need to like let let's say from let's say you're an enterprise or a small company, you have to give like everyone an extra YubiKey or an extra phone so that they can log in on the desktop if you don't want to have it on the same device or so. So there might be extra costs. Um, the key might be saved to the same device as the login. You know, so if someone takes, as I said, takes the phone, you have weak authentication. They have both the login if you save it to the device and also the uh, passkey or uh, Web and key, and yeah, the uh, if you use pass keys, I'll skip that. Um, your keys will get synced to the cloud. I'll get to this. Um, so now, most big companies are um, 
pushing for pass keys. Apple does it, Google does it, uh, I think Amazon does it too. Um, One password does it. You should get rid of the, their their ad is like you should get rid of passwords at all because it's it's hard to remember passwords. Use secure and unique password, you'll know it. People could use password managers, but it might be easier to just uh, use like your fingerprint on your phone. And I think it's a totally valid thing for probably 99% of internet users. The other thing that they say is it will work on all devices. And there my doubts start a little because basically pass keys is just web auth n with a little extras. Or a multi-device web auth n as I've read somewhere. Um, what is happening actually is if you set a new pass key on your device, it will get synced to the cloud. So let's say I'm using a Mac, I'm using an iPhone. I create a passkey to log into google.com on my Mac Safari. It gets the private keys, gets synced to uh, Apple Cloud, iCloud, and then synced onto my watch, onto my, uh, my phone, my iPhone. Um, and then I can log, log in from all these systems. That's pretty cool because I can now log in from my phone. I don't have to remember the password. Let's say I generate a very good password on my computer, on my desktop. This is really cool. I can copy paste it and then type it on my iPhone for an hour if it's like 30 characters long. So now the key that doesn't even know it needed a pass key is just synced to my iPhone. That's pretty cool. The problem is, in my opinion, that iCloud, if you turn on password sync, one, they know your passwords. So if you're using multi-factor uh, authentication passkey, like password and key as the second one, then now you give them both. It's not worse than before, because before you had multi-factor out, they knew both too, or the, both as the one password. But and I think, don't get me wrong, this should, be, this should make life easier, logging in securely easier for a very large proportion of internet users. But there's some maybe even company policy that will stop you from syncing uh, password stuff, and this includes pass keys into the cloud, okay? So, uh, and now is the problem that you can, if you're a Safari user, I said it before, this kills WebAuthN for Safari, because they force you to put on, to, to enable cloud sync, and it use, it, it WebAuthN worked perfectly on Safari, but now they just killed the feature, basically, if you don't want to sync. Um, yeah, so relatively high security level. It's probably stuff like your mother-in-law or whatever would, should use instead of typing the same three-digit or six-digit password on, on every shop they use. Um, it prevents phishing. As I said before, it's unfishable. Um, you don't have to remember complex passwords, actually, because the general idea behind passkeys is not as a multi-factor, like second factor next to password, but just to replace password. The downside is, especially smartphones have no good protection, okay? And the problem is with all the syncing tools, they, they, you have no way to choose which passwords to sync. So maybe you are cool with like having your, I don't know, your Tinder password synced to iCloud, but not your bank account password. Right? There's no way to distinguish. Either you sync all or you sync none. Um, and there's another one. Um, you have people have like server admins or, or companies have to give you some kind of reset code. Because if you lose the device, or uh, for whatever reason, all your devices that are synced, I mean, yeah, if, if you have multiple, okay. Um, yeah, it's really bad. You need some kind of backup password. Now you have backup passwords for every password that you were trying to replace. I don't know if that's like, in my head, this is kind of like going back to the start. Um, it's vendor locked in. You cannot, if you use Chrome password manager or 1Password or whatever other password on your one device, you cannot sync it to your other device that uses iCloud or something like that. You have to use all Google account or all Apple account or all one password account. I said earlier, there's no selective sync. Um, password and sync and key, if you have passwords, are synced to the same cloud device. I just forgot one that I got into my head. Um, oh yeah, there's like a point. They say you don't have to remember any password. 
But then again, it's all tied to your Apple account, where you need a password, or to your Google account, where you need a password. So at some point, yes, it's easier, because you don't have to remember 100 passwords, or your password manager doesn't have to contain 500 passwords, you just need one. And I don't know, like, I've seen people losing their password manager or Google password or so, and then you have, like, backup keys. How do, what do you do with backup keys? Do you print them out and put them in your, in your storage or somewhere? Do you put them, do you write them down in some file next to, like, post it <laughs> onto your computer or so? No idea. So, I would just want to wrap it up again one, once more, and then you're free to leave, um, or ask, or discuss. Um, the web auth and, and secure token is, in my opinion, like YubiKey on your keychain is, in my opinion, the most secure or most possibly achievable secure combination. And then you can, if you want, you can add shit on top. Like from a server admin perspective, yeah, put TOTP on top of it. If you run like, I don't know, l nuclear stuff, um, I'm not in that business, but like, I would love to see people use a YubiKey because that's something you don't, I don't know, has any, who of you has lost their keys before? Like physical key, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you need, you, yeah, if you use YubiKeys or Nitro keys or stuff, it's, it's a little piece of hardware. It probably costs them to produce like, I don't know, one euro or so, my, <laughs> probably less. You buy it in twos, would be my, my recommendation, okay? Or use like an old phone or something like that as backup. Um, there's a high com convenience level when using biometrics without the security token. You don't have to search for your keys that might be like downstairs in your house when you're, or upstairs in your house when you're working from the back uh, for, from the uh, cellar. Um, you, can, you can drive the decision um, as a server administrator like what kind of options you set, obviously. So if it's a bank account, you probably want higher level security than on your Twitter account. It might differ for people, so it depends on your attack or threat scenario. Do I have one more? Oh yeah, that, that's the last one. Thanks for joining. Uh, if you have, <laughs> thank you. We will have a Q&A. Yeah, sure. If you have questions, questions, please line up at the microphone. Please don't cross the camera in front. <laughs> hey. How are you? Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, it's a very cool topic, and I think we will see it a lot in corporate environments. Yeah, uh, totally. But let's say we don't want to use these cloud features due to the vendor lock-in. Um, how could we do that? So I'm thinking like using the YubiKey has some restrictions with a limited number of slots. For example, so why can't we put the private key in our password managers and have the password manager act as the Yubi key? Like virtually, you could then back this up yeah. through OneDrive or whatever other IT uh, means. And it's it's actually people are working on that. Like this is one of the big things that One Password is doing, um, or that that they're advertising for that you can like st uh, then. Uh, store the, the or use it as as a web authenticator next to your or like as an alternative to your device. Um, then again, you have the same problem again. And there's one company that has all your stuff and like stuff like One Password does. I think they do cloud-based only currently, but yeah, yeah, there might be. I don't. I'm not aware, but it should be possible. Like to have a, another open password manager that you care for it yourself. I think Bitwarden is working on it, and this is very likely to be seen in a, at least companies that people around here work for more than one password. Yeah, it should be, should be possible. Um, so my question is uh, quite similar. Um, does WebAuth then require you to use hardware tokens? Is this no. part of the standard? Because if it's not, like, there's great open source password managers. If they adapt to the standard, you can do all your great um, crypto security stuff and have no vendor login and still use WebAuthn. And because okay. I think WebAuthn is great, I just yeah. want to use the, the tokens. Yeah. I'm not sure, actually, what the, the Aspired spec is in the end. I'm very sure that most, at least most companies that are part of the FIDO alliance, which is the major driver of this, let's say would have a hard time of you op using open source, you know, like 
it's not in their interest to do this. But if there's uh, like one password, for example, is is part, and they have this exact problem. Um, it might be possible that you would need the uh, hardware security chip on your device to create the keys and but then save them to your password manager. I don't, yeah, I don't know why it should not work. But I'm, I'm like, I, I don't know actually. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, to the best of your knowledge, how secure are the YubiKeys themselves? Uh, like several months ago, we had the entire story with Ledger where it was like, oh, we can actually totally export your key yeah. material from it. I think there was in, in YubiKey 4, uh, up to a certain serial number or, or certain level uh, version, they had a problem where theoretically people were able to recreate the master key due to some faulty implementation. But I'm uh, like, I have no idea about crypto at all. You know, like when I was preparing the talk, I learned that you call that string to verify from the server a nonce. <laughs> so my, my crypto level is very, very basic. I think generally, I would imagine if a company like Google, which is known to have very little breaches, I think, uh, that I know of, uh, uses uh, security tokens, they will have this thing covered. I'm very sure that they have thoroughly tested all these things. But yeah, it's it's just, if there's no flaw that people know about, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Do you, do you know which brand does Google use internally? Uh, the question was, because he has no mic, uh, which brand Google uses. A couple of years ago, I think it was 2017-ish, uh, Google came out with a, um, a set of blog posts um, that they were using Titan keys. And they have, it's just another brand, it might, the chips come probably out of the same factory in China somewhere. Um, but like they're using Titan keys, I don't know how it is yet or now. Um, and they also had like a an advertising thing where they enabled you to buy a set of Titan keys that do Bluetooth and NFC and USB and whatnot. Okay, so, but generally, I, I don't I, I don't want to advertise for one brand. I don't know um, what I can recommend when looking at at keys like security token keys. Think about what kind of adapter you are using most with this key. So if you use, like I have a MacBook Air some kind years old, it has only USB-C ports. My phone has USB-C port only. If I use a USB-A port uh, authenticator, then I can show you. <laughs> It looks like this all the time, so you need an additional adapter all the time. And <laughs> then I would imagine you you run around like uh, with your keychain, and the adapter falls off on, and stuff. So think about it first. They they have it in in several different uh, specs. They also you they, you can also use NFC. Just hang it to the back of your phone. That's pretty cool. But yeah, in the end, just I I can't recommend a brand actually. Thank you, Sai. Yeah, if you have...